Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zinger show with I, your host Agassino Zinger and this is episode number 526, that's 526 of the Agassino Zinger show with I, your host Agostino. hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do, smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, a 54321 star review will be much appreciated, much more well, well well welcomed and very very much grateful if you do that leave a review on your apple podcast app if you have it five four three two one star review one word two words i don't mind just leave some reviews so people can see that people are vibing with the show that it's enjoyable and that you like the stuff i have to talk about i've already got a few on there already seen so thank you so much for those who've left them i would appreciate some more get around to it when you can get around to it i appreciate you and of course, support via Patreon is also welcome too at patreon.com for just Agostino. You'll have a bonus episode of that coming out tomorrow. So if you haven't subscribed to the Patreon yet, make sure you jump on there already. The descript the link will be in the description. It's patreon.com for just Agostino. I'm trying to get up to 20 backers. I'm thinking I'm about 13-ish. So if you can get me to 20, I'll be super grateful. It's only a pound equivalent of a dollar. Check in. Check in for a month. If you don't like it, you can always cancel any time. So check in. But I think I, I provide good value. I do one bonus content one piece of bonus content per month or per week sorry and then also do a bonus um live stream show that i do at the end of the month so if you want to check out those bits of content and you like what i do already here on this main podcast then please check me out on patreon too where i do a bonus episode of the show and i'll try to get those out every single week so you get one bonus episode included in your tier whatever tier you are the mid the low the middle the high it doesn't matter you also get a live stream or video content only for patreon that's not going to be seen anywhere else so make sure you jump on it don't delay support the kid i'll be greatly appreciated of that but yeah here we are again bagging it all out as per usual i've got a couple of days free over the weekend because i've got a holiday so i've decided what well, the holiday i was meant to take to berlin i've now decided to turn it into like a content creation weekend so there should be a lot of stuff coming out i was going to try and do pirate studios and do a mix which i mentioned earlier in the podcast but seeing as you know the rates over at pirate studios are so crazy high right now i thought you know what i'm gonna rejig it just gonna focus on doing more podcast content get that out and then focus on the dj thing maybe later on hopefully do um well not hopefully the plan is at the moment to record a really long lengthy maybe four hours set that i'm gonna put out around um new year's eve so hopefully it should be done you know, before obviously new year's eve and i'll have it kind of queued up so it can kind of release so people can have something to play their raves or their house parties or just when you're at home in your bed and whatnot um i'm not too sure if many people are actually going to be bothered about going out this year i've got a feeling that everyone's kind of and i'm not say sure going through the motions but i don't get the same sort of level of excitement as you usually get with new year's eve which is understandable considering what we've been through and considering what we're going through now at the moment with this new flipping omarian variant there doesn't seem to be ever a moment where we're gonna suddenly get over the hill or get over the line right it doesn't necessarily feel that it's going to ever happen it feels like we're going to be living in this perpetual state of just uncertainty governments around the world are not going to know what to do and we're just going to be left to just pick up the pieces or respond in jest right we're going to have to decide what we do um you know ourselves of our own lives because we've basically been pushed into a corner no matter your age whether you're 16 18 24 32 44 55 56 or 66 sorry as time goes on you're going to be put in a position where you're going to be forced to decide what you want to do with your life in terms of living in a world or well, living in a post-pandemic world or living in a, a post-pandemic or whatever it may be right um in this quote-unquote new normal you have to decide what risk you're willing to take um and just how you want to go about living life because if you wait for the government to, to tell you or to give you permission to go about living your everyday life you're gonna be waiting for ages you're not seeing any real change really if you think about it from how we're addressing or how we're kind of combating COVID from the start, the middle, until now, really, for the most part. Obviously, some governments have decided not to be so draconian and lay the smackdown or the, sorry, the lockdown hammer as aggressive as they're doing in places like Australia, New Zealand, Japan and shit. Obviously, because they're land, they're kind of islands so they can basically get away with being a little bit more um, harsh and a little bit more strict with their guidances because they can kind of lock in. But in general, it feels like most governments are basically weighing off or pulling away from the lockdown hammer and just trying to see if they can get by with, you know, um, vaccine passports, mask mandates and all that sort of jazz or just mandatory. Was it what's that place in Europe? What was it? I read somewhere where they're doing this thing where if you 
were refusing to get a jab over a certain age you'll be fined a certain amount which is essentially making you have to get the jab it's kind of a roundabout way to probably get around any sort of like human rights violations but just saying you're oh the fines only because you don't have it not because you have to get it sort of thing but of course it obliges you to get it unless you don't mind giving the government 1000 euros of your hard-earned money every single month just because you don't want to have a jab so it's an interesting place to be in um i understand why everyone's again new year's eve i feel like it's a little bit meh this year also i understand too from like a logistical events management point of view if you're an owner of a bar or if you're a promoter or whatnot you're probably going to want to just take baby steps towards planning something like that you don't want to invest too much money um in bookings in production and just admin in general and just to have it kind of pulled you know have the rug pulled and if you your feet on the 18th of december or something do you know what I mean? no one wants that and that's likely to happen too with this government they, they love a last minute cancellation or a last minute u-turn sometimes for the good sometimes for the better so it's understandable why the new year's eve hype is a bit low but i'm gonna do my best to service whatever needs my um valued audience likes or wants whatever it may be so i'm gonna record my little mix i'm gonna have that on video I'm gonna have that uploaded already on the audio as well have that all queued up and i should have that already ready to go for the new year's eve and then i'm planning also maybe to do a little christmas eve thing as well because obviously i won't be recording on the 25th so if i can get something planned or pre-done already before then that might be good and i'll get that put up and streamed or premiered as well on the channel as per usual and then obviously release podcast platform if you're listening to this so keep an eye out for that keep an eye out for that one but yeah many things to jump on into to talk about so let's just get on in it and just kind of you know decide what we're going to do going forward in it or just no let's just talk about the topics that make sense right now the topics that make sense right now so this is something i just sell pop across my timeline just now it says travis scott cacti seltzer discontinued which should come as no surprise but also is a clear indication that most people especially the ones who are kind of the um the ones who are in charge of all the big sort of deals um the kind of power players behind the scenes the quote-unquote fixes I've come to the conclusion, which a lot of people have come to the conclusion of, you know, if you're rational, clear minded and not thinking about this in an emotional way. I think most people, even if you're a diehard Travis Scott fan, you have to come to realization that you're probably never going to see your guy release music or do a show for another two years at minimum. Right. And that's mostly to do with just a court case, not nothing to do with how I think he should go about his career in a moral sense or an ethical sense, because, you know, there is no such thing when it comes to entertainers and celebrities. We've seen it over the years. For us to expect it from these people is just asinine it is what it is i think if he could if he could perform tomorrow if there was a show he could do tomorrow and everyone would be okay with him doing it he would do it like there is no and again that's the height of having no morals or ethics right it's not because people let you do it it's because there's something about your moral code um where it wouldn't sit right for you to go and perform until this case would be done but if he was able to imagine if we lived in a society where everyone just said you know what let him let, you know he's innocent until proven guilty let him have his day in court but as of the moment he should be able to earn a living but allowed him to do that socially right and he didn't feel like he was kind of gonna um create any backlash he would probably go and do it so if that being the case let's take the morals and ethics out of the way and just say purely in terms of a business point of view he won't be able to do shows again for two years because of the court case obviously looming over his head um i think it's in the billions now last time i checked in terms of um what their the, the families of course of the unfortunate kids that passed away at that concert or the festival sorry are suing um travis and i think live nation a few other people break somebody else mentioned it too so there's a lot of money on the line but in general why i'd say that is because it's probably gonna take two years for the case to conclude we've already seen what's happening with the justice millet case and we're going to have a conclusion hopefully with the megan the stallion v Tory lane's case too i'm guessing with covid anyway it added maybe an extra six months eight months of court cases but from what i've seen so far when it involves high profile people in america it can sometimes be really quick or it can sometimes be really long there's no real kind of judge or gauge of how long these court these cases go, are going to take to get to court because i'd imagine in the interim lawyers are talking to each other trying to work out if they could do a deal without going to court because no one wants to do that because it's expensive and there's a risk you might lose blah 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 blah. but in general because of the sensitivity of the issue because how horrifying it all it all was i do respect them to do be as far as possible to make sure they can assert blame where it needs to be because of course the state of texas doesn't want to be blamed for anything either so they're going to be fighting their case there's a lot of interesting conflicting interests at play and i would say someone like a travis unfortunately because he's so brand friendly because he just you know for lack of a better term we'll say it later with the 
Charlemagne put, um, interview. But he doesn't really have a personality in it. He's a bit of a blank canvas. Unlike a ASAP Rocky, unlike a Louis Uzi, but who are kind of maybe out- outspoken and, you know, ruffle feathers in their own ways. Travis Scott is just a, basically a blank canvas, right? So if you're a brand and you've got this dude who's got braids and makes his particular kind of music and he's from this lineage of, of kind of um, cosigns or whatnot, he's a perfect ambassador because he doesn't really do much in the press or the media that would quote unquote get him cancelled. So he's perfect for brand partnerships. But on the, on, but in the kind of, on the opposite side of things, if something does go wrong, he's easy to, to jump off of because there's nothing tying you guys. There's no like real bond or connection there. There's no like long lasting legacy. It's just a cash grab. You're trying to leverage his audience to get to jump on your product and service and he's obviously just trying to bank the money you're giving him to do the things that he actually wants to do so there is no real kind of love there there is no again not love but there is no kind of real relationship as they say in the marketing media world so it's no surprise that this um seltzer brand that i hadn't even heard of um had decided to kind of jump ship and kind of you know basically go somewhere else um i'm interested to know if this is a seltzer company whose name happens to be Cacti, who kind of closes up with Travis because obviously his moniker or his kind of symbol kind of thing is a cactus, obviously named after the record label. Or if it's something that he created in partnership with them and now that they've pulled away from Travis, it's just going to be defunct because there's a lot of money on the line. It's a lot of money they basically pour down the drain because of, again, I don't follow much of Travis's kind of business dealings, but from what I do remember uh, prior to Astro World, you know, tragedy, he was promoting cacti super hard. Kids would be sharing images of themselves going to shops and buying bear boxes. It was sort of like the hype beast version of White Claws, right? Um, but especially for the streetwear kids. They were really, really down with it. And he was kind of obviously down with promoting it as well because it's a cool brand. So, sorry, it's a cool little product he's doing. It kind of marries up well with his audience in terms of the rage and all that stuff prior to obviously the deadly circumstances of that festival. But this is, again, another... I wouldn't say a kind of um, cautionary tale, but these are one of the these are one of the negatives of being such a brand friendly, milk toast personality type person. When something does go wrong, people will jump off you straight away. But then, if you're brand friendly, you also get all the deals. So it's too. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's that's the issue you have a, to have at play here. So the article says the following: Travis Scott's cacti hand seltzer, sorry, hard seltzer, will have to find a new home if it hopes to continue because the whatever that company is has made the decision to discontinue the beverage so he's doing it in a partnership i guess right that makes sense in an announcement on friday ab said after careful evaluation they decided to stop all production of the brand development of cacti agave spiked seltzer we believe that the brand's fans will understand and respect this decision makes complete sense here's him promoting it hanging outside of a truck it looks pretty cool got the jacket on the merch or the, again you know, he he basically prints money with brands, right? He creates this hard let seltzer brand. He marries up or partners up with this production or basically, I guess, um, a person that can make the, the, the actual thing itself. He packages up. He sells merch alongside it, does cool activations. It's, you know, he's a fucking walking ATM. According to the report, it, um, at age, the company would um, would not specify the decision to became it, the decision because of the what happened at Asher World. It so was close to Travis, however, tells us that the two sides had an agreement that was to end on November the thirtieth. Yeah, right. They always say this sort of stuff, saying it's not a cancellation or crease or decreasing of an ongoing agreement. We are told the number thir- November thirtieth, so the decision was a mutual one. Yeah, of course they would say that, but the way that he was making money hand over fist with this collaboration, and the way I saw it, still, it doesn't make sense, right? They're, they for sure would want to continue doing it because why not? Um, but then of course to now is obviously a perfect time to pull out if you did want to pull out because effectively you're going to have these drinks sitting in storage for two years because they're not going to sell the way they were before because the main person at the front selling in that's an issue with lining up or, you know or aligning yourself with a guy that's so like singularly tied to the brand itself without Travis Cactus doesn't survive Cactus Records doesn't survive or Jack whatever it's called right on so he needs to kind of everyone's futures on the line that's the issue that i have with this as well that he has to kind of have in mind which is again goes back to the charmaine interview that i'll talk about later but he's got a lot of people's livelihood on the line due to his you know his team or whatever it may be oversight in terms of the national world festival a lot of people's financial um security future prospects are going to be severely damaged by having to take basically a two-year break and wait for things to get better he'll be okay personally you know he's fucking with kylie um part of the Kardashian clan he's not he doesn't he would, he would never have to worry about money for the rest of his life i'm pretty sure he's probably made a good amount from the stuff he's done already 
but for the people around him it's probably going to be squeaky bum time man it really is it continues here it says cacti seem to be a marketing hit selling out in stores and even causing a frenzy we would um at, sorry we would, when ts hit a or travis Scott sorry hit a local grocer in los angeles to promote the product um it's not it's unclear if travis will attempt to repurpose the brand elsewhere it probably will do um again that brand that company a whatever it's called how do you pronounce that name uh let's give it a whirl and Hauser Bush, they'll probably end up coming back around the table again. If he ends up being cleared of all charges or he ends up getting away with it, quote unquote, they'll definitely be back on the table because it's again, it's, it's an easy money play um, to kind of line yourself with this guy and kind of print out money in the ATM. But again, no surprise really that that's happening. Which then brings me neatly on to the topic at hand. I want to speak about a little bit more in detail or in depth a little bit was Travis' decision to sit down for a face-to-face -face interview with Charlemagne the God one third of the breakfast club and it was pretty bad pretty bad um not so much for what he said because there's only so much he can say with the court case looming over his head and I'm sure he was advised by the lawyers to avoid certain things so again no nothing to really complain about in that regard but with that being said why speak to the media if you're going to speak to the media and if you want to kind of try to rewrite the narrative or try to present yourself as some being something more than what people already see someone callous someone devoid of emotion somebody um selfish um somebody um that put their fans in danger all those things that people think of you you need to have an interview where you're able to be honest and upfront to an extent right where people can see a different side of you and they can maybe see you know what maybe he's not as bad or as evil as we thought he was going to be but in terms of it trying to convince people who already think it's all his fault it did nothing to change that in order to convince people who are in the middle sit on the fence not too sure how to make their mind up it didn't convince anything to the families who are still grieving or for the loss of their young relatives or family members friends it did nothing to bring closure it did nothing to kind of heal the pain or soothe it which it wasn't going to do anyway but it did nothing in terms of doing that and for him as well in terms of just presenting himself as being human in that regard it did nothing either because you know i can count on one hand the amount of travis scott interviews i've actually watched because they're quite hard to watch right kind of similar to like um again i'm not kind of denigrating the guy but it kind of it kind of reminds me of trying to get through famous dex interview he's clearly got issues plus it's compounded famous Dex specifically he's clearly got issues plus it's compounded by his crazy drug uses so it, it kind of doesn't make for the best interviews, right? He kind of just comes across slurring. He doesn't really know where he is. It's just a shocker. And Travis has obviously got some form of social anxiety, right? Something that he doesn't really like to be in front of cameras when he's not performing, which is like sort of a common thing I've heard amongst um, entertainers and artists and whatnot. Sometimes, you know, when they're away from the stage, they just want to be incognito. They don't want to be seen. They're a completely different person to when they're off stage and on stage. And you can see that from Travis Scott's personality, which is probably the reason why he's avoided any sort of like proper long form interview outside of whatever stuff that he can do to maybe promote some merch stuff or stuff that's very controlled, very scripted, not scripted, but you know, very controlled in a way that it's kind of done. But in terms of just sitting down, shooting a shit podcast style, um, and talking about a very heavy topic, um, something that he probably is still trying hard to process. This was such a terrible idea, like legitimately a terrible idea. And um, it kind of solidifies this feeling that I've always had in my head that largely or in large part i think most celebrities or most entertainers especially the ones on the upper echelon the ones in like the tier a right i always break things down in like a tiers let's say a b c d right and in each tier i would say there's three sub tiers and in any work walk of life especially entertainment and if you occupy the top 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 tier i've always thought to myself that most of the people that they have around them excluding friends and family are not there to help them they're there to just kind of protect their own careers or boost their own careers they're not actually looking for the best interests of quote-unquote the client they're looking for the best interests of themselves that's what i've always kind of had that sort of inkling and feeling and i think again this is a horrible analogy a horrible example but one of the things that kind of drums it home to me is why a tv series like succession is so good succession is so good because it presents an unabashed unashamed raw kind of view on what it is on what it kind of looks like and what people sound like on the inside of these big corporations that do like a social faux pas right that kind of um get on the wrong side of history or 
they're at the center of a crazy storm, some sort of sexual allegation, racism thing, whatever, homophobia, whatever, right? They're at the center of something. And again, in for us, the public, we're on Twitter threads and we're complaining about stuff. We, we see it through one reality, but in the actual buildings where these things are taking place, no one actually cares about how this is hurting people's feelings or how many people are kind of disenfranchised with the brand, all this sort. No, no one cares about all that fiery stuff. If anything, they're all just trying to make sure that they can get their mortgage paid on time. But they still have the possibility to go to those really sunny luxury resorts that they're going to every summer and to make sure that they're, you know, getting ferried around in really expensive cars and whatnot and, you know, hopping on private planes. That's what they're in it for. They're just protecting themselves. And succession is a good example because they're all supposed to be working for a family business. You'd imagine there'd be a little bit more sort of um, love between all of them. But if anything, they would happily stab each other in the back, in the face, the belly button in the eye, the armpit. They don't care. They don't care about anyone apart from protecting themselves. And I think what you're seeing with this interview is clearly the people around Travis who are advising him. Or again, I think the story came out that said Travis Scott actually went to do this interview or whatever you believe. But I still think the people around him clearly don't want what's best for him. They clearly just want to make sure they protect themselves. They want to make sure they can you know, afford a down payment on their house as due all this sort of stuff that's basically tied to him because again he's such a big star that he's essentially paying for people he's essentially providing people the lifestyle they would never have if he didn't exist and again they could say also he wouldn't be the artist that he was if they didn't exist but for the most part the talent is the rare commodity right not a lot of travis scott's come around so when these people in the entertainment industry see him and see how brand friendly he is and the ability to kind of essentially just double triple his album sales every no basically increase his album sales every time he kind of drops over the period of his kind of career um and just basically and reinvent himself the, the the kind of relationship he's got obviously with kylie there's those, so many things that would make those people kind of eyes you know light up green with envy right and so see a dollar sign so it's no surprise that those same people would advise him to kind of go in this interview in the hope of trying to rewrite the narrative which he didn't and on the side of the breakfast club, beside the Charlemagne thing, the other thing where it doesn't look good as well for Travis is that of all the interviews that he has done, or the interviews that he's kind of done over the years, you don't really see him, if ever, on those kind of platforms. At the breakfast club, Hot 97, I think he's got a couple on there, to be fair, because I think he's got a good relationship with Peter Rosenberg on there. But he basically, for the most part, avoids posting or being aligned with some of these kind of, you would quote, quote unquote, ratchet stations, right? He just avoids them which is understandable as well, because I've, I think I've mentioned in another podcast before how I get why some of these um, newer artists wouldn't want to go on a breakfast club because it's a messy show, isn't it, right? You're not going to get messy questions from Zane Lowe. You're not going to get messy questions from Pitchfork, Vader, or, yeah, or Rolling Stones, or what the other publications. They're not going to give you messy questions. Even TMZ probably won't. But you know if you go on Charlemagne or you go on, sorry, The Breakfast Club and you get interviewed by Angela Yee, and uh, what's his name? Make sure this guy in Charlemagne, right? They're for sure going to ask you some random thing about some baby mother that you don't really speak to too tough. Something happening in your hood with some whatever gang. They're going to ask you the most messiest questions. And you don't want that. You want to be talking about your art. You don't want to be put in a position where you're made to look uncomfortable. You're made to look unprepared. You're put, you know, kind of like taking off your square, whatever. No one wants that. So I understand why they don't go in the stations. But you then can't turn around when you're in the moments of need and you're grasping for air and you're drowning then suddenly try and, you know, get the hand of a black station to try and rehabilitate your image when you didn't care about them to begin with. So if I was a breakfast cup people, I'd feel a little bit used. Of course they wouldn't because they only care about the views and the numbers because ultimately that's what they're in the business for, clicks, listens, all that stuff, I understand. But you'd feel a little bit used that this guy didn't give you any looks, any kind of cosign, and care about you as all. And then now he needs help. He's trying to come and suck at the teat of the black mother, right? Or, you know, you know what I mean, right? In that regard, he's trying to invent it. And this ain't going to work either because, I don't know, I've never really thought of Travis Scott's audience as black or white. It's just kids, isn't it? So these are not the people who he needs to, he needs to convince. He needs to convince the everyday, average kind of music consumer, the kind of person that's happy to take their kid to a Travis Scott concert and wait in a car park. You know what I mean? That kind of person. They're not listening to Breakfast Club. They're just regular adults and to make sure they can get their kid the flipping Travis Scott Jordan ones or whatnot, right? So he needs to convince those people. And I think these interviews don't do anything to convince anybody, in my opinion. They're just a bit self-serving. It's like, you know, look at me, I'm sad. Look at me, I'm going through stuff. 
um again it's obviously self-serving for the people around him we're also trying to protect their um salaries trying to protect their futures trying to make sure their kids can go to private school next term because again i'd imagine private schools you don't pay by the year you don't pay by the year you pay by the term either way you pay so that that is due very soon so it's no surprise that suddenly he gets wheeled out now to kind of sit there in front of the cameras and do this and i just think given the nature and severity of the issue given the amount of kids that legitimately pass away given the untold pain is caused people even all the unanswered questions this just isn't the time or the place to sit down in this interview because you can't be honest of course with the court case over your head and he just isn't a guy for it he doesn't have charisma he doesn't have that much of a personality which is probably why he's avoided these interviews in the first place but you need those sort of things to kind of curry the favor of the public it doesn't really matter what the public think anyway because it's all going to go to court so you know he's going to get his day in court in that regard but in the court of public opinion currently he doesn't have the minerals to be able to kind of rewrite that narrative so i just think it was a complete waste of time if anything it probably did, did more damage than good and eventually this is probably going to be something that's going to be used against him you know what i mean that's the kind of unfortunate side of it but as i've said before i still think two years at minimum before he's ever has the ability to go up on stage let alone live release shit and again, the thing that made him a superhero or the thing that made him so incredible amongst his peers was the fact that he's so bland as a person that he can just, or as a person, not as an artist, as a person, that he, he's, he's incredibly brand friendly. But on the, on the other side of things, when things go wrong, it's easy to drop because he's so empty and there's nothing there. And that, I guess, is something that he's probably going to have to look at when he does come out of it the other side. Eventually, he will end up to. Um, if that was me, personally, I would say, I think I've said it before, and something that happened a tragedy where kids are that pass away and my entire image was tied on me caring about the kids and shit i would have just retired i would have just retired and just try to kind of um pivot my career into maybe being a helpless so being um selfless and setting up charities and i don't know maybe opening a recording studio for the new generation i don't know doing something that kind of didn't mean i was the center of the attention on stage and shit because I, I just wouldn't feel comfortable getting up on stage again and trying to corral interest and love for fans who i clearly didn't have their best interest as a heart and that last incident you know what i mean that's what i would have done i would just retired but you know you can't tell people what to do in their career it's a short one um it's a mistake you know obviously i'm sure he didn't mean what well, yeah, sure he didn't intend for those kids to pass away for sure so everyone should have a road back to redemption this is his but i just think this was an unnecessary step he didn't need to do he did to do this but you know Maybe I'm in a minority when it comes to that one. Next, we're going to move on to this funny, this is a bit of a funny story. This is KSC of Business Teshno, which I haven't covered on the podcast here for a while because I've been basically tapped out of anything that's concerning business techno people. I just had enough. All of that kind of plague-rig stuff in the beginning of the pandemic, middle pandemic, which I covered on my podcast, was just dying. It's just kind of draining me of life and of hope. Um, in the end, I kind of came to the real, real resolution or realization that most of the people that are going to these playgraves anyway, especially the ones that are in front of quote unquote third world countries, they were all done in really affluent areas for affluent people um, who had the means and they had the willingness to go to these places in the first place. Um, of course, it was sad to see any working class people in those neighborhoods having to be the ones servicing these people, right? The ones wearing the mask and waiting for them, hand them foot and hand them the mojitos and whatnot. Of course, that's, un that's unfair. But for the people that live there too, that's also an opportunity for them to make some money and be able to put food in their children's table because government was giving them any support. Um, so they, they're being able to earn a wage was something quite beneficial. So I was conflicted in that regard. But it just wasn't nice to see pictures or videos or reports of people from Europe flying, you know, many thousands of miles away in the height of a pandemic to go and DJ somewhere. It just made me think to myself, like, why? What the? What? What gives? What gives these DJs the kind of um? not gumption but what gives them the flipping idea that somehow their career is way more important to maintain than any other musician it's something i didn't blew my mind during the height of the pandemic again bands are gonna find it difficult because they're gonna have lug equipment around but for the, some reason a dj thought it was imperative for them to go and play places like the world would stop moving if they weren't able to play another flipping melodic house set somewhere in the middle of some villa in flipping you know I don't know Guadalajara like no one cares bruv really no one cares but they would do it anyway regardless and again I say no one cares the crowd certainly did care the promoters certainly did care the local dealers probably cared 
the, I mean, everyone cared. The local taxi drivers, I guess everyone cared in that regard. But again, I kind of tapped out of it. But anyway, fast forward to the present. Business Techno shared this video, um, courtesy of oh, this video recently um, recorded somewhere in Brazil where Masha Plex is playing for an adoring crowd who all happened. Don't you find it interesting, right? That again, I'm a fan of Innovision and stuff. And I would say, in my opinion, Innovision, that whole crew, extended family, or everyone that kind of get posts on the Arm to Dixon page, I think they're a. St- they're like a separate class they're a little bit above in terms of quality of music they put together djs the parties they do it's just a different level like lost in sound or lost in the moment sorry the party series that dixon does obviously under Innovision or you know whatever he like those kind of location specific parties that he does there's nothing that those crew does our guys in the business techno people that's that's close to that sort of level maybe the afterlife parties you know whatever but for the most part they're in a separate league of their own but i just find it interesting visually how all these business techno parties, all these kind of melodic house parties where everyone's wearing fucking all black and they're doing that twirly twirly thing, right? And there's always those kind of scantily clad girls that get posted up on those kind of techno meme pages with the clips and shit that share the same seven clips of the same seven girls. I always feel like, why are all the crowds exactly the same no matter where they are in the world? They have the same mannerisms, they have the same fashion, they have the same look. They just all look the same. Like, it's just weird and this is again the middle of brazil or somewhere in brazil i don't know where and they just look the same even though we can't see them a lot of the crowd we see some people of course behind the booth but everyone looks the same you know the flipping cringy touchy huggy thing behind the decks all the time the unnecessary stupid fake smile like well, everything's the same it just blows my mind but anyway this video it becomes a business techno says the following last weekend Masha Plex threw a glass into the crowd during his set at the warang um injuring a young woman on top of other instances that night neither resident advisor mix or dj mike have addressed this in their new section again can you expect them to do so probably not i guess if i would to google Masha Plex's booking agent i would see that he was a booking agent that had essentially 60 percent of all the people that make the most money <laughs> in this industry are basically signed under his agency i'd imagine possibly and a lot of those people have deals and whatever you know they give money to these kind of platforms and news publications there's other deals they have in place there's loads of finagle things that happen to the music industry it just is what it is so i'm not surprised they wouldn't want to come out there and start pillaging him in general and after his whole nina kravitz thing he had going on maybe master plex has got i don't know who knows what's going on there I'm not surprised they're not reporting it, but the beauty of social media now is that you have a pages like this that can show or that can share or cover this sort of news. People like myself can cover it, other people can see it, and then that's basically how it gets covered. It doesn't always need to appear on those main sort of dance music sort of platforms in order for it to be legitimate. But it's just funny to see guy DJ, you know, playing that kind of music, melodic house, and then feeling so amped about his set. That he's willing to throw a glass which is probably i would assume it's glass if it's brazil it's not gonna be those plastic glasses they give you in fabric it's definitely gonna be glass during a breakdown of a song that's what makes it even worse it's during the breakdown of a song just before the the drop comes in he decides to fling the glass into the crowd i'll play the video now Kind of make more sense if you know again this is super cringy and really pathetic too but if he kind of just had the glass and he signed it and he was trying to like imagine like it's a breakdown he's hugging the promoter the dj is playing back to back with you just to promote the event booker right they always want to stand next to the dj to let everyone know i'm the one i put the party on you know they're usually short as that guy is right they're just you know wild out looking people it'd make more sense if they were like sitting down talking and then he kind of got the thing oh he got the glass and he kind of impromptu had a sharpie in his hand right just happened to have one scribbled his name on it and then was like looking at the crowd like oh does anyone want and everyone's like going crazy and then everyone was engaged active what's going on then he threw it and then people expect to catch it right that's one thing but you're just a breakdown right it's a melodic house set it don't take about two minutes for the drop to come in anyway people on their phone some people are fiddling around their baggies trying to see if they can get a bump or coat or car key someone's checking their phone to see if somebody messaged them back someone's just daydreaming tripping whatever they're doing they're not they're not like super locked in. And again, Melodic House set, someone's probably recording free through their phone and not even paying attention. They're just looking at the looking at the screen. And then he throws the glass. So for sure, when he threw that, that probably hit someone really hard because they weren't even listening. So it's such it's such like a 
he tried to be a rock star, right? And he did the most un rock star thing ever. And then on top of that, the actual throw itself is incredibly gay. Like, you couldn't get a worse throw if, if you had to try it. You know for sure you when you see somebody that didn't play sports when they grew up or wasn't really that good at sports growing up, it's quite clear to see which again you can't, you know, it's unfair to say that because, you know, their DJs is they're supposed to do fucking kick ups and to be able to fucking throw a fast pitch, but this is a pretty pathetic throw. If you're gonna throw it, you throw it. If you're gonna give it to somebody, give it to somebody. But don't do this kind of in between like dad over arm hook thing. Like, what is this? He's so crazy, mass your black hume. Is that oh no? How do you say him? Um, he's a crazy. Is one. He's a crazy. The mass your place are crazy or so ever. <laughs> in Brazilian, in Brazilian Portuguese accent. But yeah, like ah, oh, absolute wild ad material. Um, did he comment or say anything underneath? I think people are here saying, um, what a mug comments. Uh, what instances? Oh, someone said this, supposedly people were pissed off because. It was billed as a real techno. I guess it was billed as a Master Plex plays techno set. It's dumb because I don't think. Again, I've seen him play a couple of times out, and I still remember that kind of iconic or memorable set he did on Boiler Room back in the day in Berlin. Something that might be the hardest I've seen him play on video. For the most part, there's that kind of deep house indie dance sort of thing that wherever he's on now. Um, but I, I've never heard him play anything. You know similar to that kind of set he did at boiler in berlin many many years ago so to expect him to do like a i'm sure he can do it because he's a very proficient you know um dj he's obviously a high high level producer he's got many different pseudonyms that he uses and he makes many different type of sounds some people argue what's the point of pseudonyms we will hear what you know who he is here by the sound of it i don't know but you know you know what i mean um but nowadays his bread and butter is basically playing this sort of stuff right FIFA music, innit? So if, if FIFA music's paying the bills, why would he go there and suddenly start playing a flipping Grease Mueller set or it doesn't make any sense, you know what I mean? Or not even that, like an Ismus set or something. It's not going to happen with him. I would like to see it though. I think, those, th th I think that's actually quite a good thing to see for these kind of guys instead of just playing their same sort of stuff they do all the time. Why don't you just mix up a little bit and say, you know, this, it's like when Scream was doing those disco sets. Uh, it was like a kind of, oh shit, you can play disco. That's quite cool. You can kind of, you know, throw people off a little bit, refresh people's memories of how sick a DJ you are, all those kind of things. But I get it, man. If you're getting paid 30 grand to play this sort of stuff for an hour and a half and you get asked to kind of change your set suddenly and start playing break beats, I would, I'll be like, no, you can go fuck yourself. I'm, I'm going to play this FIFA music and you're going to enjoy. Continues here. Um, another person says, and we still get disrespected by club owners while DJs like him come up here and shit on us. The true problem is that the crowd still idolizes people like him. That's a little bit of hate can't be hating that much i understand he's probably this guy's probably a local dj who's finding it difficult to get on the circuit over there and then you, you see somebody flying over to another place in your country playing in a club that's not allowing you any shine and everyone's going crazy over him it's, but that's a standard thing and it people are always going to praise or get hyped about people that are not from your country he's obviously again one of the top top level again i'm not a fan of him nowadays but he's really really up there in terms of success and profile and name and being able to kind of sell tickets so it makes sense why they do it um i don't think his success is any sort of denigration on what this guy is doing so i think this is a little bit too hate laden for me it continues another one says in contrast the last time i saw moody man spin he played gwen mccray okay keep the fire burning man um and put it back in the sleeve and handed it to somebody in the front row pure class yeah i've seen him do that before true yeah true that's a good point the the kind of contrast in it right one person is a legit rock star without even trying. He turns up with his hair permed and relaxed and shit. He has girls massaging him behind a booth. He, sometimes you'll get, you go there on, he's on rollerblades and shit, wearing tracksuit bottoms with a flipping sweat, what's great, sweat wristband and whatnot. Another person is pretending to be a rock star. Uh, just flop because he wears flipping Rick Owens and has, a, uh, has one of those haircuts. Those haircuts where you flick it. <laughs> it continues. It was a it was a plastic cup. The artist admitted his error and apologized. Okay, cool. It wasn't it wasn't thingy. Cool. Oh, that was the club you played at. I think, isn't it right? Yeah, Warren Beach Club. Okay, what what are the replies saying here about them? You should have booked me. You can't. Okay, cool. Um, sorry. Here's okay. Here, here's a short story. Someone responded to the, the the club saying it's a plastic cup. Everyone chill out. 
uh, someone said here in response to them here's a short story to help you understand a person was given a plate and asked to throw it on the ground and later asked what happened to which was answered it broke and after that the person was told is this a fable why well, going for saying fables on instagram comments lastly the question came again what happened okay i don't, I don't give a shit man you're not going to be fabling me here um not surprised to see a plague rave dj acting like that it never fails but again man i don't i don't know look he did the thing you threw the thing in the thing everyone's okay let's all move on but just to end on this one i, I don't know man I, i'm not really as much as i don't like the, some of the stuff that these guys play from that whole sector i'm not for this whole like snobbery of like play grave all this stuff and business at the end of the day this is basically the most commercial well received it seems like aspect of dance music anyway right this is the sort of stuff you hear mostly on those islands in ibiza this is what you're going to hear mostly in the festival quote-unquote circuit in europe i'd imagine so for the most part i don't know if i'm just throwing out there i'd imagine so this is probably the stuff that's going to be played mostly right um if that's the case and the general public like it what does that say about the general public are you basically insulting their musical taste and saying that their musical taste isn't valid because they don't like the people that you like i'm of the thinking that business techno people serve a purpose because when you're an artist and you don't like what they're doing you react to it by doing something that you want to do and then you hope that other people that also like the stuff that you like will support the stuff that you do and then boom you form a little scene similar to what i was talking about with all this quote unquote alternative nights we have at the moment in london which are focused on kind of uplifting and promoting people from queer lgbt right that's a clear reaction to the you know commercialized straight white male sort of scene that existed beforehand without that to react to that scene probably wouldn't have existed they kept hitting so many brick walls get anyone letting them in and they're like you know what fuck this we're gonna put our arm raves on we're gonna do our own festivals i've already mentioned the body movement stuff and then now they're competing or quite, kind of comp but they're like basically on the same playing field right they're not even doing it in some far-flung places they're in the same playing field same area putting the events on the same sort of time in terms of calendar wise that's what you want to see but again it's a reaction from the general commercialization of it all that's kind of pushing them in that regard so i think they serve a purpose i think you're definitely going to see the most creative and the most kind of awe-inspiring artists coming out from this generation because they're having to butt up against this imagine if you're a kid and you're making actual quite interesting melodic house interesting deep house music interesting house music in general in this interesting tech house and you're seeing all these guys playing and you're like oh, i'm tired of jamie jones i'm tired of all these guys i want to kind of surpass them that's what they're there for they're there to kind of set a, set a standard or set a benchmark maybe cringe you out a little bit be a kind of commercial maybe sell out and you're meant to look at them and think okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do better than you and then you kind of go up and then you come through and the next person does the same thing i think all this kind of snobbery is a little bit it's a little bit lame in my opinion i think it's a little bit lame at the end of the day as well you know i mean it's just raving it's just dance music going there to essentially get smashed have some fun with your friends keep it moving in it well, hold on let me get my second I was about to make sure to get everything. Just a shame that I've got a it's like a smaller than it. As long as it works, that's all that matters, isn't it? Then next on the list, we have more news about DJ stuff. Again, stuff that I don't really understand too tough. So please forgive me for just covering it on the surface and just keeping it moving. But essentially, people got very annoyed. Or I saw people on social media getting annoyed because this meme was going around of a record label, DJ collective, booking agency, whatever you want to call it, called Ghetto Tracks or Ghetto Track, Ghetto Tracks. I think it's spelled with two X's actually. Um, they was going around because they're called Ghetto Tracks, but they all look like this, basically Caucasian or, you know, some semblance of white. And I guess people were saying that the name Ghetto Tracks immediately kind of brings up connotations of black people. And somehow black people have ownership on the word ghetto, which is interesting because it feels like when somebody does label you ghetto and they don't know you just because of the color of your skin, you take offense to it. 
But then when you see a group of people who don't look like you using the name ghetto, you also take offense to it because if you think like it's talking about you. It's like, I don't know, again, who knows what that stuff. I don't really take too much attention to it from the outside, but hey, I'm just going to talk about this because it's an interesting to- topic to speak about on the podcast. And I guess people are getting annoyed by it, but there was an image exa- actually of the label people themselves. If I want to quickly see if I can get it up on here. Latest. Okay, it's not going to be up on here. But anyway, the consensus overall, let's just read the consensus of what people are basically just talking about. Um, this person said, a German label calling itself Ghetto Tracks. I'm not sure if it's an appropriation, ignorance, or worse, total awareness of history or both. I guess what people are arguing, or again, I don't really agree with it, but I guess what you could say is that nowadays things have changed and if you do want to call yourself ghetto tracks you have to be aware and sensitive to the connotations that name brings along with it you also i guess that's aspect act of it this i guess there's also an aspect of it where some people would feel as if like if you're caucasian and using the name ghetto tracks you don't necessarily face the same hurdles or obstacles that somebody black would face if they were trying to um Use that name in order to kind of propel their work right they would they would be getting judged in a very sort of like intellectual um almost um yeah it would be it, it would be, it would be treated a lot more intellectually it's like um i guess it's similar to like you know football commentators whenever they're speaking about a black player especially a young one coming up there's always mention about athleticism and power and pace and stuff right but there's never really conversations you're never going to hear a um I commented to talk about a young black athlete especially in football um the same way they talk about a white one especially if it comes to technique especially especially if the player's big yaya Torre used to get a lot yaya Torre, um former man city player former barcelona player also a former olympiacos player um obviously was very powerful but was more so of a number 10 even though he looked like he could be a number six or he could be a number four he played mostly in a number 10 role like an attacking midfielder so he was probably more similar to like a pablo aymar than he was to like a patrick vieira but because he looked like a Patrick Vieira, people automatically kind of um, ascribed pace and power to him when clearly he was, had a lot more finesse, um, a lot more kind of, you know, um, depth of touch, um, a lot more, what was that word that people say? Um, just a, he was just kind of, he basically, he basically played like a Rolls Royce, right? Like he's basically, he was more similar to like a Michael Ballack than he was to anyone else, but they would never use the same words they used on the Ballack that they used to use, um, they used to describe Ballack, they used to describe Yaya Torre. It was always pace and power. So I understand why people are getting annoyed by it. But it just, again, it depends where you fall on it. Do you think people change the way that they react to it? Or, or I want to change the way they react to it. Are certain terms kind of essentially off the table if you're not from the place that that term is basically associated with? Because essentially it feels like a double dipping, right? You've got the benefit if you're white to basically use to get on tracks as a name. You don't get looked as a ghetto person, but then you also get to use the ghetto tracks, you know, sort of symbolism to kind of propel your artistic career forward same thing i think guess was getting said about those guys from detroit what are they called i'm not even they weren't even are they from detroit? i don't know but that group called the detroit swing remember they, they changed their name now i've got the name is now i guess that was the same issue people had with that right they were basically double dipping a couple of white dudes using their legacy and the history of detroit especially with the electronic or dance music but then they have the benefit of not being kind of cast in the same shadow as the guys that were coming up in that scene or maybe looked at a certain way, whatever it may be, but then they also get to use it as a thing to kind of propel their career forward and gives them legitimacy. So I understand. Another guy who I follow here says, like obviously the name Ghetto Track sucks and so does a cultural appropriation, but why focus on that when you've got Nazis infiltrating the dance music scene and brutalizing people trying to keep it alive? Another comment says here, again, I can't take dance music social media seriously, outrage seriously. Sorry, when in Europe is on the topic, sorry, uh, when Europe is on topic, while you're busy whining about a German label called Ghetto Tracks, name sucks, obviously. One of the only independent French cultural magazines installing and reinforced door to protect itself from Nazis. Yeah, true. Um, again, another person says here the name Ghetto Tracks is racist and appropriative, but that doesn't negate what Turkish and Arab minorities face in Germany. Of course, again, it's just like, it's just oppression Olympics, isn't it, here, right? It's like, who's who can claim sovereignty on ghetto who had it hardest right who actually grew up poor who actually grew up rich how does that contribute to your worldview um um does that make you more victim than i am it's just it's just nonsense it all is a nonsense really the wider to the wider scheme of things like there's so many issues at hand and forget even the what you mentioned earlier about nazis you know trying to beat down the door of a magazine just in terms of being getting people like how are these people this is how people 
has anyone addressed you know the disparity when it comes to these dj lists they want to stress stress the disparity when it comes to booking agencies the disparity when it comes to lineups in terms of race sexuality whatever people are just you know just going on as if like things are normal and okay when lineups are still the same relatively magazines are still covering the same people relatively there's no path really for the most part for people to kind of progress from being a bedroom dj to being able to play in big festival stages anymore you basically have to create your own thing right you just have to create your own thing there is no kind of way to kind of go into the gated institution and kind of be ushered through unless you move to like a big city uh with that what that has that kind of infrastructure in place for you to plug into like a berlin where you can go through the residence program with certain clubs okay so familiar people do but for just a lame person who has none access to us, who doesn't want to do that, just lives in the middle of wherever they live, but they have a passion for the scene. How do they go from being a bedroom person, streaming online for their YouTube followers, and then having the ability to play at Bergheim, having the ability to play at an ADE, having the ability to play at a time warp, um, coach, whatever you want to play, I don't care what your, what your dream is. How do they do that? There is, there is no way of doing it. And I think those things, in my opinion, again, sad, weird to say this, I think those things will address a lot of the tension that exists, because I think a lot of the tension and the anger that does exist comes from a real place because people legitimately don't think that don't see themselves see they're not being represented rep, they're not being represented represented is that the word right as i'm saying right on stages and stuff and they're also not being seen or heard right no one's acknowledging their pain no one's acknowledging their struggle so when they do see something that they can latch onto and kind of talk about and attack and use that as a thing to kind of beat home the point of like you guys not being fair, they'll grab onto it at any point. Do you know what I mean? But I think in general, if there was more fairness, if there was more, not 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 kind of sorry, not fair. What's that word called? Um, if there was just more opportunities for people, right? Again, not guaranteed outcomes because no one wants that, but just give everyone a fair crack of the whip. I think most people was bad term in it, bad analogy that one. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I think most people would be a, would would not take this sort of stuff to hand. But I can understand if you're sitting there and you're struggling. You, like I, imagine you're a kid, right? And you've prep and you've legitimately come up against barriers to try and get a record label started because you feel like, like imagine, yeah, who's that? Who's that guy? I forgot what label it was. He was kind of accused of not wanting to release an EP because he felt like it was too black and too gay whatever and right imagine that that stuff is true imagine if there are labels out there that don't want to have certain artists on their brewster because they got they think it might ghettoize it or it might make it look a certain way cool so imagine you're that kid and you said decide to you know go under a moniker make another pseudonym whatever it may be you know create a fake profile and make yourself out to be some white kid from frankfurt and then you still not getting any headway and then suddenly you see this group called ghetto tracks <laughs> who don't look anything like you basically being able to profit on the place that you call home that you've kind of tried to propel yourself forward with and not getting away i can understand why that make you feel upset i can really do but it's not really that big of an issue i would say personally i think there's other pain points that exist and then of course ghetto tracks himself um this is their website you know it says here we're why Girl Tracks. Girl Tracks is a vinyl only record label and booking agency for ravers from ravers to for ravers, founded by best friends that have been breaking it down for many, many years and still keep going, tired of bullshit and sick of elitist rave culture. So they're actually representing a good cause, right? They're actually most of it again, I always said before, most of dance music stuff is always a reaction. You go to a club night, hear someone that's playing that shit, somebody that's amazing, you react to it set up your own label you set up your own club night you start DJing yourself that's all dance music is that's why i say everybody is crucial everybody has a valid place in it even if you're crap even if you're good you play a vital role in this scene of us because everyone reacts to what you're doing um uses inspiration uses as fuel whatever maybe they actually did the same thing i quite don't mind their logo um but this is their post them reacting to all the kind of backlash they've been getting online this is the following um, on an Instagram page it says, hey, friends, we just went to quickly seize a chance to address a few and admittedly funny memes concerning our name going forward to court. I'm glad they said it was funny because let's be for real, right? This picture is flipping hilarious, right? <laughs> let's get our tracks. I think there was another one too with that, um, all those guys in a row, like a tennis match with their mouth open. But that's, that was a quality meme. I'm glad they could laugh at themselves a bit. 
Um, our label was founded by two Turkish Germans who in 2000 and 2010 had difficulty getting to clubs in Berlin or Hamburg and many Arab or Turkish people there still have. Growing up in 2000 and 2010, we have been subjected to racism in public discourse, personal life, and in this case, more importantly, we have been the dance music scene of any city we lived in. So what they're basically trying to say is that Turkish people are the niggers of Europe. Is that what they're saying? No, I'm joking. Um, it is true though, because I do remember, this is a bad thing to say, but I do remember from watching the series four blocks or 40 blocks, something on Amazon, um, you know, basically having an insight into the kind of struggles um, that the Turkish population face there in Germany and specifically in Berlin, because that's where the TV series is based. And then one time I went to Berlin myself, um, I got speaking to an Uber driver, as you do, and he was basically echoing the same things and basically saying that how a lot of his friends who drive Ubers and shit sometimes have resentment for people like myself under those are people coming from abroad who are able to basically who are kind of welcomed in their city with open arms without being able to speak the language despite turks themselves who come over um making every effort to speak the language because of course no one's going to speak turkish to you if they're non turkish right so they definitely have to learn the language they get to learn language and still they're kind of looked down upon and they kind of he said to me like a lot of his friends sometimes i think i think i was saying something like oh some of my friends have had bad experiences in uber and he said maybe some of it has to come with it from the resentment they feel i'm from outside um especially people that look like myself right it, like imagine it's compounded even more so if it's a black person you're like bloody hell i'm getting treated like shit i'm turkish and you're treating the black person better than me and you can't even speak english um which is already is a bit funny but you know what i mean so i, I get where they're coming from i get that there's pain there but again oppression olympics it doesn't really matter everyone goes through shit no one has a flipping no one owns the term ghetto the ghetto is all around the world ghetto is a fucking like the definition of ghetto that's nothing to do with black people what is the meaning of it let's just google this quickly nonsense they're part of a city especially a slum area occupied by minority groups that could be anybody anyone's a minority right like it doesn't put in the coverage an isolated or segregated area of a group. i understand i understand what people say, but hey let's just relax Next slide. Um, we understand and we value how the term ghetto has come under scrutiny in recent months. Um, white and upper middle class artists in the US and wider um, Anglosphere appropriating the term ghetto to promote their music to their own financial gain and nullifying its political cultural significance is certainly problematic. I'm wondering, it's a slight after or slight side thought. Because I wasn't, again, even though um, Nina Kravitz, Ghetto Kravitz, that track was like one of the, like, when I first heard, again, I first heard that out in Berlin for the first time in my life. I think that was probably my first introduction to maybe dance music of that scene because I was familiar with the deep housey sort of side of things, but I didn't know what that was, right? I was like, what the hell is this? And I remember at the time hearing it thinking it's amazing. And of course, you know, digging deep and kind of, you know, obviously having a love for electronic music that I have now at the moment. But I wonder when that tune originally came out, how did people react to it when she called the song Ghetto Gravis? Did people have a problem with it? Were people all right like when it actually did come out at a time i wonder but again it's a different world back then isn't it? maybe people were safe with it. i don't know if you're around during that time please let me know in the comments um it continues next slide we noticed that people on the dance floor were almost exclusively all white students from the upper middle class immigrants or working class people were either turned away at the door or didn't even bother coming in the first place we then started hosting parties ourselves to combat discrimination and identification of the dance floor again noble calls these guys seem cool to me this course, however, this discourse, however, shines a light exclusively on the U.S. and Angus fear and completely neglects the recent history of the use of the term in Germany. It was a gangster rap from the U.S. that brought the term ghetto with its cultural significance, meaning back over to Germany in the 90s and early 2000s. Again, he's right about all this stuff. Um, that term was embraced by German hip hop and was subsequently weaponized by the white. Um, I don't know what that term is. Um, to racially discriminate Arab and Turkish immigrants communities, as well as denigrate poor white working class people from most of the German gangster rap scene, which I guess is dominated by a lot of those people from those kind of areas. I'd imagine so. Because all the videos I see of German rap comes from guys who look like they're Arab of Turkish descent. So again, this is all lining up for me. Having expressed race, sorry, having experienced racist discrimination involving the term ghetto ourselves and now being called out for using it hurts. Exactly. Imagine that. You get called, get, you, you're getting discriminated against in Germany, right? For your background, for your color, for your creed, for your religion, whatever it may be called. You're being others, you're being kind of alienified, whether that's if that is even a term, by being grouped under the term ghetto. You then try and um, embrace that term and use it for good. 
and then it's being weaponized against you again from people who have faced maybe worse ex discrimination who probably should have you sh they should feel like they have allies right in the kind of um when it comes to conversation around ghetto right they should feel like everybody around the world should kind of identify with their struggle because in every part of the world if you're a minority you basically experience some level of discrimination right the, 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 no matter where you are for sure you've experienced some of it maybe not all the time but you've experienced some so you see where they're coming from but then to have people on social media basically telling them they have to change their name is mad i hope they don't change anything by the way I hope they don't change it to whatever turkish um translation is of ghetto don't do that just stick with the name it is what it is isn't it just standard it's a, it's a different thing in europe um what different thing for them is all what they're going through he continues to say, same goes to the artists on the roster who may be read um, as white from an American standpoint, but have faced discrimination in German no, no, nonetheless. Talking about their roster, someone on that roster might have to change their name. Because um, <laughs> that name is, I saw that name and I thought, what? That name is fucking wild as a DJ name. Maybe it's something else you think of in your, you know, in those kind of countries. I don't really know. Um, but um, the DJ might have to change their name in, yeah, this one. Rita Retarded. Yo. It should be Rita Redacted because we don't use that term anymore nowadays. But calling yourself Rita Retarded is mad, isn't it? Like, that is legitimately one of the maddest names I've heard. Like, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I was like, what? Why would you even call yourself that? Like, Rita Retarded. That's such a bizarre name. I guess we can click on her profile and see if she's any explanations as to why she was called that when i was growing up my dad used to say i was retarded so sure what's the name um rita's journey began in what where is that where's sil Sile, Sile, and shifted further east ever since from hell to now leipzig okay so i guess that's a place in germany um continuing on the rate she's probably will uh have circled the earth around about 20 years dj proper is always the worst uh, my one's not my one's equally as cringe is what it is her first exposure to electronic music was listening to old school house and rave music in the cars of various relatives <laughs> in the cars of various dudes you hooked up with in secondary school i don't know joking, joking. anyway um either inadvertently or intentioned they passed the affinity on to her as well when she was 14 rita was then guided through um further into the depths of fast-paced club music by her friends who showed her dubstep techno and dmb okay we know what she's about she probably wears air maxes and she doesn't assume right yeah probably does um, she picked up DJing in 2018 and inhale. Oh, I guess that is a place in Germany. When, when, when I, okay. And quickly established herself as a household name in the East German scene in Leipzig, collaborating with Bake Le Cake um, series and the record store Very, where she was sucked even further into the aforementioned depths of club music. You might find her right now in Very, um, waiting for waiting for you to get yourself some hella delicious coffee and cake and at least a good record. Rita sets. So they call her Rita. They don't. They don't say retarded. Retarded says range from hip hop, jazz and soul of a particular. Imagine going to a club night and seeing somebody. Imagine going to a jazz club night and seeing somebody on a lineup called Rita Retarded. What? Um, get a tech to joke. Right, yourself. Fucking bizarre name to call yourself, isn't it? I think yeah. Last time I checked on Instagram, she was privated. So maybe that was a recent thing, but I doubt it. You know, a young girl that DJs on Instagram, you're probably not going to have your account on private. She probably privated it. Because she got loads of abuse, which, you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, you need to change that name ASAP, my dear. Um, you really do just for your own sanity. Because they're not, they're not going to stop getting at you if you don't change your name. And it's just such a nonsense name anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's not even that Rita, the first name is perfectly nice. Just call yourself Rita or Double R or something. I don't know. But yeah, you'll figure it out um next on the this on the list of this topic hopefully i'm not boring you with this but it's just come over my timeline so i just wanted to talk about this um quickly we finish this quickly it says we appreciate the wider discussion around this topic to some degree but its foundation lies in overly complex academic discourse that is inaccessible to many people that have um, that too heavily relies on academic works describing the reality of America or Britain. The inevitable shortcomings of sh projecting this discourse onto Germany are further amplified by the frankly shocking lack of Turkish or Arabic people within the scene in Germany. Very true. Basically saying, you're talking about us, you're talking about our struggle, but then we're not even the ones in the conversation. You're talking at us or to us. We're not even the ones like sitting side to side, which is completely, completely... Um, 
And while we can understand why there is a lack of Turks and Arabs in the scene, many of the people patting themselves on the back for being well first in academic online, this schools probably can't. Well, I, lo I love how they're coming out with this. So we appreciate the friction our name causes and we will continue hosting truly inclusive parties. Big up ghetto tracks. Okay, cool. I, 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 I like that they, they, took, they, saw the, they saw the human in some regard, defended themselves as best as they could and kept it moving. But yeah, I wonder what you guys think. Again, there's loads of comments on here. Everyone's writing their essays and kind of getting there. Oh, Jesus Christ, man. People are going hard with the comments. Um, but yeah, someone said something about the Raiders. After research, man, shut up, man. Like, what? You're equating the Oakland Raiders with fucking and oh okay I, I'm I'm out man I'm out I'm out but anyway if I'm if I'm wrong let me know in the comments um if I'm right let me know in the comments I doubt I am because I think a lot of people have a very strong opinions when it comes to this sort of stuff but I think if anything we need more of this we need more of this kind of discourse more of this kind of conversation around representation in general I've always said it from before that's why I've been never a big fan of this whole crap about gendered lineups there's an issue in general representation overall right like I said like go on any EDM page. Most of those EDM pages that talk about, you know, Tomorrowland or whatever have always got really scantily clad, amazingly attractive girls on there wearing amazing outfits. But none of those girls are ever playing on the DJ lineups. None of those girls, I'm sure some of those girls want to play. Cause that's, that's the same with all of us. We went to our first festival, we went to our first club night and we got inspired. And then we decided to become bookers. We decided to be photographers, to be DJs, whatever. We all did the same thing. We all came through the same path. And I'm sure there's some girls in those groups of people who go scantily clad who wouldn't mind being a photographer, who wouldn't mind being a DJ. But you don't see any of those girls on the, on the stage on the lineups. It's the same old 17 million blokes who all look the same. Fucking crappy DJ names. They have the worst DJ names. Worst ones. And they have no representation over there. So again, that isn't a, even a gender. That isn't even a gender thing. That's just like a... Can we just get different people on these flipping lineups, please, for the love of God? So you can't even say it's a gender. Well, if you want to say a gender thing, cool. But then it's not what are you going to do then say it's a gendered race thing. No, it's just a straight up. Let's get some new fresh faces on there. We don't have enough of that. And again, a place like Berlin is kind of, I would say, it's pretty rich in terms of its multiculturalism, so and so. Um, so if that's the case, why can't their club scene or even Germany in general, and Berlin, Berlin probably mostly rest of Germany probably not so much but in general why can't the club scene be a little bit more varied why is it all the same flipping genre why can't you not find any decent hip-hop disco and whatever nice going on there that's what comes this needs to be had and the sort of discourse I think is going to bring about some of that hopefully in, in the end again pick up ghetto tracks hopefully stick with your name don't bend on that one it's a retarded you need to change your name ASAP that name is you know it, it is retarded like just to, to call yourself that especially nowadays just making a rod for your own back it just makes no sense just allow it move on um why would you do that it's similar to like i always thought to myself like similar to the other girl what's her name that i think she's berlin as well germany what's her name jamaica sook i was surprised no one kind of came after when everyone's trying to tell people for their names it's like why would you call yourself that just unnecessary you know i mean i think some people just enjoy the pain of having to go through the defending thing it's just unnecessary just uh, any maybe that's just her name and her parents you know white people and calling their kids after flipping destinations ever they traveled on but um yeah weird 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 debate what else we have to talk about here we did that one we did this one we did a quick one here courtesy of vanessa friedman on a twitter account um and fashion editor for the new york times says now demna Basilia has only going to change his name now. Well, he's, going, he's only going to go by them now, similar to what Kanye is doing with Ye. So she says here in a tweet from the Balenciaga 422 show notes, from now on, Demna uses only his first name, distinguishing as an artist title from a birth name and therefore separating creative work from personal life. In all press releases going forward, he chooses to be referred to simply as Demna. Uh, okay then from Vesa of course being a little bit snarky and funny but I don't see anything wrong with this it's a standard path of course when it comes to artists and creatives which is probably why a lot of people like to kind of operate under a moniker under a tag under a nickname or whatnot to kind of separate themselves from the artwork that they do. and also considering he's going to do maybe other projects going forward um he's a bit of a beast in terms of fashion design anyway it would make sense why you'd want to separate it in some regard and I just love it I love it everyone calls him Demner anyway um his surname's difficult to pronounce for certain people 
myself included, even though I'm a big fanboy. So now going forward, we don't have to worry about not saying his name correctly because he just goes by Demna. Simple, easy to be done. I get it all. You know, some people are getting so, you know, snarky about it. But I guess this is fashion and this is how these people act. And then of course, the Balenciaga Pre 4 2022 collection happened too. Um, I was really happy with um, how they presented it. It was basically kind of 90 inspired with the VHS tape um, invite. Supposedly the VHS tape is, itself was defunct. It didn't work, which I don't know if that was a troll or they just couldn't be bothered to get something that did work and put the show on there. But hey, it is what it is. They filmed the actual show like a 90s um, runway show with camera sort of jittering and stuff, grappy, grainy footage. And I also like the little slight kind of edit that they did in the pictures of the runway pictures or in the videos itself as well, where you see people sitting there dressed appropriately like they're from the 90s and also no smartphone in sight. So it's a complete kind of shift to what you're usually seeing when you're seeing kind of runway images, right? Similar to festivals, you see people with phones to kind of kind of allow you to kind of date certain festivals, but you just see nothing of the sort. So they really went ham in terms of getting that done. Obviously, there's a show review here. We quickly this because um Demna had some good comments he made here he says here the 90s are the decade um in which i realized i loved fashion He's, he declared on the phone from paris people have forgotten that era because you can't really search it fashion was dirtier that's true isn't it that's a good point maybe that's why people are so obsessed with the early 2000s and shit because that's stuff you can that's probably when the internet first was at its peak right the lime wire sort of era so that's why a lot of that stuff you can search, like the Britney Spears, sort of like inspiration, fashion, all that sort of stuff that people are doing at the kids. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, good point, Demna. Now, people have forgotten the area because you can't really search it. Fashion was dirtier and nastier and fun then, not filtered and behaved and polished and proper seen on every single platform as it is now. I like that. I like that, what he's saying there here. Obviously, Demna, da, da, da. Um, another quote from him is Skip Cord as well. It's the Balenciaga lost tapes. It's like discovering a show that was never happened. It's like a blurry period for Balenciaga before Nicholas Gesker arrived. The video tape he sent out was unplayable. It says he obviously did it. It's like a useless archaeological artifact, he said. I like nostalgia. I think it gains new value when everything is metaverse and cyber. I mean, I do embrace these projects too with the, with the games, clones, cyber fiction and everything. Uh, da, 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 da. But I do like that because I remember that being a, one of the, my favorite show titles I remember seeing from an artist. Um, the artist Lucian Smith had a show called Imagine Nostalgia where he had all these kind of um, pieces in the collection that were either things taken directly from his childhood or things that he wished he could have done in his childhood. But you, don't, you didn't really know what the line was because nothing was obviously stated as to what he actually experienced growing up, what he didn't experience growing up. So he had like a basketball hoop. I think he had like a baseball, baseball, baseball mitt like a pickup truck loads of things childhood things like you know maybe your first car whatever it may be um and that was how the exhibition was kind of laid out and i love the idea of that imagine a soldier because we kind of do it ourselves our own sort of stories we have a list narrative about how we grew up the circumstances around it what um that to kind of um kind of like to attach symbolism or importance to things um retrospectively right to make it make sense or to make it hurt less like this was really good for me because it let me do this but there's no if you look if you look at it and you kind of you know address you kind of break it down there's nothing to suggest that that action is what contributed to the now the next action it's like people that say oh i got fired the best thing for me ever because led me to this place but there's no saying that the firing actually led you to that place it might just be a coincidence it might just be a luck it might just be happenstance whatever it may be so i love all that kind of stuff especially now in the digital age you can kind of play with that a lot more because again like i said if you did if you are born in the 80s or into the 90s there is no real record of how you got to where you got to at the moment so you can sort of fill in the gaps how you want to you kind of present yourself how most artists do right and every artist has that or musician especially has the that kind of stupid story about oh when i was in the kitchen my mom used to play michael jackson and i love my dad loved bon jovi so i had this mix you know, everyone's got that stupid story no one just grew up in a house where there was no music played and you had to listen to it in secret in the garage everyone's got the oh my dad was into this my mom played the piano the thing come on relax it continues here um what's more another quote by demna he says here um we were coming up with things in the studio that could have been 30 years ago but they look just as good today we think fashion changes really fast but does it actually i've agreed him because you look at the first balenciaga well you look at the first demna by balenciaga show or yeah demna by balenciaga, balenciaga by demna show and you look at what he's doing now and it's essentially the same thing obviously some things have been proportions have been tightened here and there some things that blah 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 some details whatever but overall in terms of the codes in terms of what he's doing aesthetically 
it's quite similar. And even if you go as far as back as saying what he was doing at Vetement, they were probably still the same sort of codes he carried over Balenciaga. So that same sort of stuff that he's doing has influenced himself into what he's doing creatively. But it's also influenced an entire industry and generation of people who are going through. And again, think of the Kanye stuff that he's doing at Yeezy. Those kind of body suits and those vests and those big bomber jackets and the trainers, that same silhouette is still running true now. People are still kind of trying to cut it. So fashion does change a lot, but not really. And then again, my last example would be Rick Owens. Rick Owens has essentially been perfecting the same look for what, more than a decade. I mean, it has changed, of course, proportions, colors, palettes, uses, um, inspiration, whatever, research, whatever. But in terms of the look, when you just look from a plain naked eye, it's still kind of relatively the same. Um, and that's basically what he's trying to drum home here. It continues again. Uh, blah, blah, blah. He says, here's, I'm cutting silhouettes in black. Said so it's my favorite color. Great to know that. We were not surprised by that. The result, blends so I can put da, da, da. another quote from him too. Another quote said here, the strongest message for me was be able to is is to be able to bring things back. He said, um, creatively, you can have ideas and then they just vanish. I agree with that one because it always feels like whenever you do something. I remember the same thing. He says, you prepare a set. You feel like it's just just it's one set and done. You just go into the next. But actually, trying to hone that one set and trying to perfect it and maybe change the you know maybe beginning and the end track except the middle there's a lot of things that you can kind of jig around with but you know that's basically starting a new but in your head you have this idea of like no find a newest blank piece of paper you know, nothing gonna flip it fully like just going again that's not how you do it it turns again so creatively you can have ideas that can just vanish the whole machinery of fashion is based on the relentless idea of progress and change this is a this season i brought back the fire high waders that we had in our last runway show in 2020 um, they didn't sell them because the pandemic came. People were asking me what you want them to exactly be exactly the same. I said, yes, that was way my way of saying, why don't we throw away the, why do we throw the girls so, so often? Which is true, actually, especially during the pandemic. I, I guess a lot of ideas didn't really hit or resonate at the time because, you know, we we're going through the pandemic and we we're going through lockdown, maybe people's idea, maybe people's eye wasn't even on fashion. They weren't really thinking about what to buy and all this sort of stuff. So maybe kind of bringing back those shoes that he felt were hits. Um, is probably a great idea. Continue to hear gone. Um, everything we buy is made from leftover skin, he said, that would otherwise be burned. If you make it into a skirt or into a jacket, why not? You can't find a lot of this all over the place. We've been doing this for a while. Furthermore, listen to the yeah. but yeah the collection itself obviously looks amazing they're taking on these little polaroid pictures with all the sh clothes obviously aesthetically and for uh creatively as an idea in terms of to put in your portfolio amazing for a fashion fan and myself in terms of looking at the clothes and seeing what i'd want to buy it's not really the greatest but then there are these additional images that i say i saw on fashion spot where they took pictures of the actual um runway or yeah well on the runway quote unquote that they recorded obviously on the vhs tape and you get kind of more of an idea of what the clothes actually look like on the models on there but again it's just really well done stuff um reconstructed looks like leather jackets great use of black everywhere again with the cup the proportions the jacket it's just all really really amazing stuff again with the fire high boots that kanye has been basically living in every single day they look absolutely brilliant He's actually wearing a new pair of Red Wing ones he wore with the, at the Drake show that look really cool. So I'm sure they're going to be sold out everywhere. Um, the great exaggerated glasses, the repurposed, or the kind of the stuff that looks like it's fur, but it's not. Again, see everyone in the front row. No one's, no one's got a smartphone. Everyone's just chilling. It's super great to see that. Um, again, so many great looks on the runway. Got those boots again. Casting's always amazing. Add them in the show. So, uh, well, yeah, Ben Siaga shows in general. Um, just really cool and again that's the thing as well that's important to note about Balenciaga and Demna in general it's like you cannot like what he does but at least he has a point of view at least he's trying to represent or showcase something right this is a very European um aesthetic right it's a very European point of view it's a very European like influence sensibility and he's putting it on the biggest platform possible that's why I don't mind Hadi Slamane even though it's a bit reductive it's a bit samey he still has a very specific point of view it's really strange because it seems like he has no um awareness of what actual kids are listening to he still believes that kids listen to indie music which is bizarre because they don't they're clearly still listening to most kids listen to hip-hop i would imagine it's the number one genre in the world 
especially among youth culture, but he's still trying to talk to that kid that wants to be in a band. Also, then he's trying to talk to the kid that's trying to go to the Travis Scott show. I mean, which is, again, I think, but it's very specific and it's very him. At least he's got a point of view. He's not trying to appeal to the masses or to appeal to everybody. He's just talking from a very specific point of view. Inspiration. I love the fact that he does that. Again, being European myself, I just resonate with it a lot more. This is something, of course, that I see myself wearing, you know, day to day. Like I could be, I could, I could, you know, I could die. I could, I could, I could, I could live another day and only wear Balenciaga and I'll be happy. Now again, got a super buff guy here. First time I've seen one of them on the Balenciaga runway. Just kind of harkening back to that's the thing. It's all about models, right? Because you don't see guys like this in general. He he looks bigger than he actually probably is because what you usually see are really skinny people in the runways, which is why those Givenchy shows back in the day with Ricardo Tishis, I bet the models weren't even that big. But because everyone was so skinny, they look like fucking NFL players. You know what I mean? They look fucking like gigantors. Look, he, that's one thing about them. that like He makes a great parker. He's got that little neck pillow that was um all the rage on the blog for a while with the hood. It just looks like a neck pillow. It looks like a jacket, maybe a neck pillow attached to it, which is a great um jacket for an airport. Fucking brilliant. If that is a fact. Um, just brilliant shit all around. I think there's a my favourite suit I'll get that oof, the way that um that, that long overcoat sits, that kind of bell shape is awesome. My favourite look is a denim look. Skewed and messed up, where is it? That's like shirt it looks like it's shrunk. The denim look here, I think it's one of my favourites. Yeah, that one, this is the one, yeah. Whatever this demo look here is, this is one of my favorite looks. It looks like, again, you can see people's eyes. That look, they definitely caught everyone's attention. One, two, three. Well, I've got their eyes on that one. Another one there. But it's a denim um, head, to, head to toe suit, I guess. Um, it's sort of skewed and cinched in inside, overlapping buttons. I'm sure you can button it regular style if you want to. But if you want to kind of have it cinched, button it across, make it kind of fit like a double-breasted blazer. Um, the Trousers have also been fucked around with and reworked. I'm sure the seam, blah, 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 blah. The wash of the jeans are perfect. Like, just great shit, man. Great, great, great shit. I love everything about it. So, yeah, big up Demna. Um, pre 4. Yeah, that was pre 4, right? So many collections yesterday, man. God damn it. Fashion's hard work. Yeah, pre 4 2022 collection. Um, it's going to be out when it's going to be out. And keep your, keep your eye out. Keep your order eye out. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll end it there for now. If I can stop there, I think that might be a good place to end it. And I'll pick up the rest later because I don't waste too much time. I suppose you're conscious of that all the time, innit? But yeah, that was Jackson's English show, episode number what? Five, two, six, I think. Thanks again for tuning into the show. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you're watching this via YouTube, like, subscribe, of course. If you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five, four, three, two, one star review. That'd be really appreciate. And of course, support via Patreon is also welcome at patreon.com for just like Ostino. And the, the, the link in my description of my podcast or yeah, podcast or video, and you can click on there. The actions, no, patreon.com for just like Ostino. And then you can obviously subscribe for little as one dollar, equivalent of one pound per month. You get access to all my bonus content, one bonus show per week, as well as another bonus live stream at the end of the week as well. So, loads of content on Patreon. Jump on there, get me up to 20 back as I greatly appreciate it. But until then, Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys again very soon. If you listen to the podcast, you hear an outro song. If you're watching the YouTube video, it's just going to end straight away. Apart from that, I'll see you guys again very soon. Peace.